Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 149 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am joined by the show's co-host, Omar Ansari. Hey, Assalamualaikum Pervez, uh, Assalamualaikum listeners. I hope everybody's Ramadan is going wonderful. We are heading into the, the last 10 days here, so yeah. what do you call it? The, the latter third. Yeah, and I can't believe, I mean, I know I say this probably every year, and every Muslim says this every year, but I just can't, I don't know where the month went. Like this time, for some reason, more than years past. Maybe it's the shorter fast. It's the shorter fast, for sure. I just can't believe we're in the 20th fast, the yeah. day we're recording today. The funny thing is, I don't say that normally. For Normally, I'm like, man, we're... Struggling we're through it, yeah. <laughs> but this year, uh, I am. I have said that hey, just man. yesterday. I was just saying... You can be uh, honest. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, you know, alhamdulillah, it's gone, it's gone well. I feel like uh, a lot of stuff going on in the community. Yeah. In fact, and yeah. we are actually in a youth center right now. Which uh, you called, and I have never been to. Which I've never been to, never even heard of, sh- shockingly, because we're in the Bay Area, and, and um, this is, we're actually recording in Los Gatos at a place called BAMREC, which is the Bay Area Muslim Recreation. Um, actually, I haven't heard of it. Very, very honored to have Absolutely. you Absolutely. I mean, as I imagine for a lot of people who are, who are out there listening, you know, this, this Ramadan is a little bittersweet because we're just constantly reminded of what's happening right now in Gaza whether it's feeling the pangs of hunger or thirst, but for me, more potently, when you break your fast and you're enjoying the comfort of your family and food and drink plentiful, um, you can't help but think about what's happening right now in Gaza. And uh, so that's certainly, I think, top of mind for a lot of us. And I imagine like you uh, or like us, our listeners as well, have heard of physicians and medical professionals who have risked life and limb endanger their lives to go and care for the victims of the Israeli war in Gaza. And, you know, perhaps even seen media coverage of individuals who have done that. And we are really distinctly honored to be joined by one such brave physician. Uh, Absolutely. I just want to echo how really honored we have. We are to have Dr. Mohamed Sube. Dr. Mohamed Sube is an emergency physician and traumatologist with a deep passion for innovation and discovery, both inside and outside of medicine. After completing his undergraduate degree uh, in biology and graduate work in sociology, as well as epidemiology and biostatistics at Stanford, uh, Muhammad took his first major dive into entrepreneurship. He founded Higher Labs, an outcomes analytics company aimed at deciphering organizational data to reshape and guide how people are managed within these organizations. And since then, he has founded and advised several companies in the health tech space. More recently, his love for science and coffee led him to launch Ken's Coffee Roasters, a Bay Area specialty coffee roastery that sources high quality coffee micro lots worldwide and featuring these unique coffees to coffee lovers around the globe. Uh, and actually, uh, Bamrec, where we are at, as I mentioned, is right next door to Ken's uh, Coffee Roasters. Um, so Dr. Sube received his uh, MD from Oregon Health and Science University and completed emergency medicine residency training at the Un- University of Chicago and Ultrasound Fellowship at UC Irvine. Currently, he serves as partner of Vituity and assistant medical director of the El Camino Hospital Emergency Department in Mountain View, California. Additionally, he practices emergency medicine at UC Irvine, Catalina Island Medical Center, Good Samaritan Hospital in San Jose, California. He enjoys spending time with his family of four, deep sea fishing and traveling to different countries to provide free medical care to underserved communities. Welcome, Dr. Sebe. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. Thank you for having me. No, like I said, uh, really honored. In fact, you just got back from one of the one such trip, and that trip, of course, being to Gaza. Um, and we're going to definitely, obviously, get into that. But before we do, I'd love to have our listeners know more about you and your background. So we'd love for you to kind of talk about that. Yeah, your family and your background. Yeah, um, I think it's, uh, you know, I'm one of uh, uh, millions of folks and uh, millions of Palestinians in the diaspora. My grandparents lived in a town called the Lid in uh, Palestine and were forcibly displaced from their homes and their lands in 1948. And uh, as many of these, you know, almost a million Palestinians were forcibly displaced off their land, they had to go somewhere. And so they took refuge in small country of Kuwait. Um, and that's where I was born in uh, 1984. Um, I grew up there for six years. uh, And I remember life. Uh, I remember various parts of my uh, childhood, um, uh, just my time with my my, uh, grandparents, my aunts, uncles. Um, 
And then in 1990, um, uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait and uh, I experienced war for the first time. Um, and it was, you know, uh, very eye-opening, I would say, as a, as a six-year-old going through, um, you know, an experience most people in the world never, ex never have in their lifetimes. And I remember standing next to the windows of our apartment building and seeing missile strikes in the distance and feeling the building shake. Yeah. And um, I was confused, kind of bewildered as a child. Uh, didn't really understand the, the danger of it all, but um, it really turned life upside down for, uh, for my entire family. We tried to write it out for a couple of months in Kuwait. And... Um, Unfortunately, it got to the point where it was way too dangerous for our family to stay uh, with uh, threats of uh, killing my father. So we actually had to escape Kuwait, ironically, through Iraq uh, to get out. And uh, if, if you're not familiar with what, you know, how, how people needed to get out two months in is the only road was through Basra, you know, through the southern city of Basra, uh, between Kuwait and Basra. Mm. All the roads had been blown out uh, into Saudi Arabia. The airport was not functional. And so we trekked uh, across the desert to uh, escape uh, being killed. Um, you know, in the moment, you, you think your life is upside down. And uh, mm. subhanAllah, th these moments allow you to uh, appreciate that... Um, you know, I always I'm reminded of the verse in the Quran, Inna ma al usri yusra. Surely with difficulty comes ease. And it's hard in the moment to really appreciate that or to really internalize what that means for me uh, in, in my entire kind of zooming out and looking at my entire life. But um, it was a means for us to come here and seek refuge in the United States. And we came here as refugees in 1990, settled in Los Angeles. Uh, very difficult, extremely difficult, not only from, um, you know, uh, from a financial perspective, my father couldn't, my father was an engineer, uh, as a refugee, couldn't get a job uh, in any company, because you can't work, you, you know, you don't get a work permit as a refugee. Um, what was so, his background? Because you mentioned one of the things you mentioned was his life being threatened. When you were in Kuwait. Yeah. So he was an engineer, uh, 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 worked for IBM as well as um, a kind of their social security administration, a kind of uh, analogous to the social security administration. And um, really what had happened was, so we, we were living in an apartment building and most folks in our apartment building either uh, were off on summer break uh, when the invasion happened or left early on. And so many of our uh, neighbors said, can you please just keep an eye out on our apartment? Just make sure it's okay uh, while we're away until this kind of settles down. And so it was not uncommon for uh, the soldiers to enter the apartment building frequently, sometimes every, every day or every other day to look for weapons mm. um, and uh, kind of just search the entire building. So... Um, I remember them entering our home many times and searching our apartment and turning things upside down and looking for weapons that we obviously didn't have um, and then would leave. And one of those days, we heard um, a lot of commotion up top on, on the apartment above our apartment, um, things crashing, breaking. And so when they left, uh, my father went up to see because it was our, our friend's home. Hmm. He went to see what had happened. And um, he entered and saw kind of trash bags filled with their possessions. A few minutes later, we saw the Jeep come back with, uh, with the soldiers. And I, I recall standing in the stairwell and yelling up to my dad to come down. Mm -hmm. And this kind of like really uh, uh, like this fear to the core um, and really not knowing like scrambling, how, you know, you should come down. He couldn't hear us. So they, they went up through the elevator with, uh, in the elevator and found him there in the apartment. And obviously, you know, they saw that he had more witness to uh, them looting what was in the apartment. And so uh, they told him, you know, uh, you know, at that time they would have these public lynchings and executions. And mm -hmm. so they said, well, you know, uh, you're going to come with us and uh, we're going to kill you. And so you have to say your final goodbyes to your family. So I remember him coming down with rifles uh, pointed at him. Wow. 
as uh you know we were when we saw that obviously you know uh that fear and uh pleading with them you know please let him go um and uh he was saying goodbye to us and then the the leader of the the soldiers there said um you know i see you have a family we're going to let you go but we're we're going to be back tomorrow and if you're still here um we're going to take you then so we literally had less than 24 hours to leave uh kuwait which is very difficult you know trying to figure out what are you going to take with you um how are you going to get out um where do you go and so um in those moments the thing that gets you through is remembering that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control of everything yeah and you do what you can with what's available to you and and um yeah that's about it so so for us um kind of fast forward to when we got to los angeles obviously um you know the financial difficulties of not having any money not knowing you know how we're going to make it you know at that time we're a family of seven um and uh we lived in a small apartment we we ended up re- renting out a small apartment in the eastern portion of los angeles and it was it was uh not only financially difficult but a big culture shock because you know we didn't know english you know had to start school and i remember being bullied and not knowing i could tell it was bullying because of you know how people kind of treat you and um laugh at you and it really you know it, it was very difficult as a as a child enduring not only that war experience but then this culture shock and trying to figure out how do i fit into this and i remember as as a child just looking up at the sky and just thinking like how small i am and like what am i doing here like what is this existence mean hmm. just like really deep uh thoughts that i would have and a lot of kind of internal anguish in terms of like why is this happening um not seeing the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually gave me by by <laughs> taking me out of that that danger as well that's just so much for a young person to process on any level you know and i and i think about what your experience that harrowing experience with the military you're at the mercy of or the whim of this army officer mm-hmm. who for whatever reason decided okay we're going to let you go and we're going to give you 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Like he didn't have to do that. Yeah. And most people will go through life never having being, you know, never having to be in a place where or in a situation where your life is literally at the mercy of the whims of an individual. Yeah. That's just yeah, I mean that alone is just is is wild. I imagine for <laughs> majority of the people listening to the podcast. So for you to contemplate these things now that you're, you know, in the states, I mean, I can't even that's that's a lot. Yeah, it, it is a lot. Um, I, I think it was um, it was beneficial though to remember. Like ultimately, yeah. what I ended up, what really gave me a sense of tranquility in my heart is that, despite all of the you know efforts to put up you know borders and define countries and so on, we're human at the end of the day. We experience all the same feelings at the yeah. end of the day, and you know that's that was an early discovery for me as a child um and i'm sure other i mean children right now as they play together and interact with each other they feel that but as we grow older we kind of constrain ourselves and mm-hmm. um and uh, you know alhamdulillah at a young age you know actually our travel documents we didn't have passports because we weren't citizens of any country if you're born in, in kuwait even two generations in you don't, you're not a kuwaiti citizen per se you're right. you have a travel document that says you're stateless and it would, i remember That's you why. know having uh, appointments with you know in the federal building in LA and for immigration and um they would be so confused like what is stateless what do you mean you're stateless no what, what's your passport it's like we've never had a passport or stateless and that's the story of palestinians you know yeah. that is uh, you know defines the experience of palestinians they're stateless right and in some ways they're not constrained to how people define you know countries and so on uh Palest- being palestinian is more than a landmass it's uh it's generations of resilience of an identity that's i would say from my experience you know uh, being in gaza is unmatched by you know human experience unmatched by any other human community 
on the face of this earth right now. And so, um, again, it really shaped my childhood. It shaped, um, what, uh, what I saw as my purpose in life early on. I had a very difficult time, I would say through elementary school. Uh, I, I wasn't a great student. Part of it it was because of the environment I was in. Mm -hmm. Uh, part of it, I just didn't have kind of the right bearings in terms of where am I going in this life? And it took actually me, um, getting suspended from school and my parents saying, you know, well, if you don't, you know, people are paying their hard earned tax money for you to go to public school. And if you don't want to appreciate that or show value in that, we're going to get you a job. So I got a job at the age of 12 in a halal meat store, a butcher shop. It was brutal, especially when people would come in asking for a chicken, like skin boneless and 24 pieces. It was like, I'm sorry, you're going to have to do that <laughs> at home. But um, it, 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 it surrounded me by individuals who really, um, they were like my, you know, my uncles, my, my mentors early on that really instilled in me um, the importance of going back and, and really um, making the most out of the education that's given to me. And I remember one Amma was uh, working with me uh, and he kept telling me like, why are you even here? Like you, you need to, you need to go and don't, don't focus on these other kids. They're not going to be a good influence on you. Just focus on yourself, focus on uh, the education that's given to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you this opportunity and take advantage of it because it, you know, once it goes away, it's gone. Um, so that, yeah, that helped kind of really kind of pivot my, my focus and, um, and uh, really focus on how I can best learn and, uh, contribute to the world around me. And growing up, um, in LA, there must be a pretty large, sub substantial Palestinian community, right? Were you a big part of that? Were, were you involved in, in the community and growing up kind of in a, um, typical, I guess you could say typical community? What was that like? Um, the majority of our time within our, uh, the community, uh, was, uh, at the masjid. Mm -hmm. So our, my parents really, one of their biggest fears that we would, was that we would lose our connection with our Dean. Mm. And our, I remember my mom and dad always telling us like, you could have whatever you, you, you know, you can in the world, you can get whatever you know, material things. But if you lose your connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you lose your purpose on as to why you're here on this earth then none of that matters. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was, that became really real for us because we saw, you know, 180 like flip in terms of we were, alhamdulillah, we weren't like rich in Kuwait, but we had, we were able to live comfortably Yeah, and then kind of seeing that. And then, um, yeah, so I wouldn't say per, we necessarily just kind of, um, were part of a Palestinian community in LA. Mm -hmm. We were just the beautiful thing about the Muslim community in the United States, it's very diverse. Mm. Yeah. And it really, I, I, I loved growing up around that. We had friends from all, all backgrounds. And mm. what really brought us together was uh, our love for our dean and our, um, our love for sharing what that dean looks like as a manifestation in our, in our day to day. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, most of our time on the weekends was spent at the masjid or community service activities, things of that sort. So, you know, I, I didn't know this, of course, and Omar, Omar and I had no idea about your background in, in, in that much detail, but it, it so happens that you follow, I think, a series of episodes that we've had where people are from Southern California from LA. So we've done a lot of, <laughs> right. we've had a lot right. of conversations around community there. So for example, our last guest was Imam Jihad Safir, who is in the inner city in, mm -hmm. in South LA. Can you situate us just again, I'm, I'm, I'm just now becoming really yeah. fascinated with Southern California topography, if you will, of the Muslim community. Um, prior, we've had guests, you know, from Orange County, etc. So if you could just to, for probably no other purpose, just to entertain my curiosity with the community there yeah so los angeles is huge when someone says they're from la <laughs> exactly. it's, uh, it's huge and depending on who you ask they define the, the the boundaries of la differently um so you know if you look at downtown la uh we were about 30 minutes uh east of los angeles of downtown la okay. um so uh, is that pasadena uh no. no we were south uh east of pasadena so okay. it's a it's an unincorporated town. It's called Roland Heights. It used to be La Puente. 
uh, city of industry kind of area. Um, if you're familiar with that, uh, probably pulling up Google Maps and, and looking at it. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, in the early 90s, when I uh, grew up there, initially in the 80s, it was like orange orchards, actually. A lot of it was oh, orange orchards. Okay. And, and then it was, um, I remember then, you know, I, I remember growing up in the 90s, a lot of gang violence around. Yeah. Um, and that really was the environment that I, I grew up around. And, and so, um, yeah, it was just like a different war zone, uh, that you experience. Um, were there like Palestinian gangs? Cause I know in places like Chicago, you had, I mean, you know, yeah, there were, auto and Palestinian gangs. So not, not in okay. LA at that okay. time. Okay. Uh, okay. I, don't, I, I don't, I don't think they have any now, but, um, right, right. no, it wasn't. And so okay. even kind of like. I remember uh, in junior high, like people trying to recruit me into gangs, and I was like, "What? No! I, like, what, what does this all mean?" Like, and I'm not even, you know, gangs end up being like, uh, uh, you know, even just ethnically like divided groups of people. I was going to say, do you, and, were they thinking you're like yeah. Latin, like 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 Latino? <laughs> it was everything between okay. like Latino <laughs> and yeah. Korean, and I'm like, yeah, I, no, I I don't think this is a, a good thing for me. Um, but uh, this was always like a struggle because a lot of the people um, that, you know, I grew up around had r really rough, rough lives too. I mean, many of them didn't have, didn't live in, in homes with parents. They had their grandparents taking care of, taking care of them. And so uh, they're really looking to find a sense of belonging and um, an identity and a purpose. So... Um, and so, yeah, the a lot of times those gangs really fulfill that uh, need, that like intrinsic need that we we all want as human beings. And so, yeah, that's uh, yeah. that's where I was. So, I mean, I guess we could probably transition to your studies. You know, um, your medical studies. Uh, I would I would imagine just your background informing like we, you know, earlier we spoke about you reflecting on kind of the purpose in life i imagine some of that informed you know your decision to pursue medicine yeah i remember as a as a child uh hearing the choppers uh, first off would always have uh the police helicopter circling uh overhead and these floodlights uh you know pouring bright lights into our apartment as they're looking for people and uh, making announcements to stay in the home. And then I remember a different like uh, kind of resonance to the chopper that's the medevac choppers from LA County. And I knew they would be landing in my elementary school grass field because that's where they would land to pick up patients. Wow. Um, and so I would just like, I remember just putting on my like uh, my sandals and just like running, uh, taking off and running from our apartment to kind of, always see that helicopter land and i was always inspired like in awe of this big helicopter landing you know trying to save lives and that was actually one of my biggest draws to emergency medicine and trauma it was like uh, wow i want to be able to save people's lives like that and that adrenaline and and that uh you have to have really quick decision making that may be um <clears throat> that may again impact somebody's chance for uh survival life or death and yeah. uh so that was my biggest draw initially my my first draw and then um and i remember watching the show called rescue 911 i don't know if you ever watched that show but I it was like reenactments that. of true stories yes, right yeah. yeah yeah and it yeah. was like really <laughs> cool for me and um and so i ended up in high school um uh, becoming a medical assistant taking extra vocational classes and becoming a medical assistant and EMT and, and and clearly your your parents' strategy of of the butcher shop clearly works. Oh, you you totally. end up at Stanford, uh, uh, yeah. So par for for parents listening out there, uh, you know, the butcher shop option. Just keep take note. Hard knock There's, school. Yeah. There's a lot of value in halal meat stores. Yeah. Always. <laughs> um, so yeah, alhamdulillah. You know, I didn't actually know anything about Stanford. I had never heard of Stanford. I had heard of Harvard and Princeton in my junior year um, because I used to watch Fresh Prince of Bel Air. And I remember <laughs> Uncle Phil used to well, I had gone to Princeton, and um, <laughs> and then uh, I got this uh, uh, mailer in in the mail from um, from a program called the Quest Scholars Program, and uh, it was started by an ER at that time an ER resident here at Stanford, um, Dr. Michael McCullough and his wife uh, Anna, uh, was an, an environmental lawyer at Stanford, and. Um, 
they started it to really focus uh, on uh, young folks coming from disadvantaged backgrounds and trying to mentor them and uh, try to guide them in, in terms of the, the processes to apply to college and how they can make the most out of college. So they reached out and I had the opportunity to um, go to Harvard for a summer mm. uh, between my junior and senior year uh, for a summer program uh, that was sponsored by them. And it was an amazing program because not only was it like an academic program, but it was um, really focused on, um, you know, introspection and kind of reflection on life and, and what it means to be alive. And it was, uh, it was, it was very life changing for me. Um, and that's when they first introduced me to Stanford. I had no idea what it was. And they said, come up here. We want you to come see the, the campus and, uh, really encouraged me to apply. And so, um, you know, with their help, uh, I was able to, you know, apply to, all those schools and, and alhamdulillah, you know, got the opportunity to choose where I wanted to go for college. And, um, stand, yes, yeah, mashallah. alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And it's a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you yeah. know? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, going to Stanford was <laughs> another 180, right? Because you're going like paycheck to paycheck, trying to make ends meet. And then Stanford is, uh, I would say, spoils the students. <laughs> I mean, it's like you I mean, walk into like this all-you-can-eat buffet constantly. And uh, I gained, instead of like the freshman 15, I gained the freshman 50 by Thanksgiving. I mean, it was like two months and <laughs> my mom couldn't recognize me when I went home to visit her. Um, but it was a great time also, not for just the academics, but we had a very strong community, alhamdulillah, mm -hmm. that... Uh, you know, the Muslim community at Stanford's been there since the 50s, yeah, 1950s. I, I, coincidentally, I'm, I'm go taking my kids to the Stanford uh, community of Thar tonight. MashaAllah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember going to those 25, when I was single bachelor, 20, almost 25 years ago, I remember going to one of those. So, yeah, it's a very strong yeah. community. So, that must have also had an impact just kind of reinforcing your your sense of connection to, to the to the community. Yeah, right. 100%. So, no. like the, what, you, you mentioned the 1950s. Is that like, like the Qureshi family? Like Qureshi was, family. Oh, okay, wow. Yeah. What, 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 Qureshi, subhanAllah. What institution has that family not touched? Yeah, mashallah, subhanAllah. Right? Subhanallah, I mean, yeah. wow. Anyway. Yeah. May Allah reward them I mean, infinitely. I mean. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, and, and I grew up, I mean, I grew up uh, going to a masjid with Dr. Ahmed Saqir, Allah alham, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but of course. He, he was like my, you know, almost like a grandfather to me, like, uh, yeah. and so. Um, he was, you know, his passing was one of the reasons I started the show, subhanAllah. because I said, we're losing these individuals yeah. who are giants. We stand on the shoulders of giants and we're losing them and their stories are not being captured because yeah. these people were humble enough where, you know. They didn't write their biographies. Nobody yeah. was following them around, as, you know, as a scribe of what they did and what they said. Um, all we have is the work they leave behind, and so um, you know we've been really lucky. I mean, right down up up the street would be Dr. Mozam Siddiqui, yes, another yeah. giant. But we've been fortunate enough because he's still with us. You know, half of the law to be able to sit with him and capture his story. Yeah, I don't know if you know, like, do you know Imam? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Jihad Tork. Uh, Tork. Oh yeah. Yeah, course, I have yeah. Palestinian background yes. as well. And yeah, yeah. He, we've had him on the show and you know, he he shares a fascinating story about his father who came as a young Palestinian immigrant in the 1950s. Hmm. And he still has the article like he was he 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 was in Modesto, California. Hmm. And the idea of bringing a foreign exchange student in Modesto was such a big news that or such a big story that it was in the local a newspaper hmm. that young Palestinian man visits. A lot of what we have done is capture those little stories. But anyway, sorry, this all started no, because yeah. you mentioned Allah, uh, Ahmed Sakhar, Allah, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you're right. I, I think we forget, we forget the incremental steps uh, taken, big steps uh, by sure. uh, the generation prior that really set up a, a foundation for us to be able to do the things we're able to do right now and uh, yeah. the the really that seed uh, that was planted for the Muslim community to to grow into what it is today and um, they just you know they handed the baton to us and it's up to us to really build yeah. it better and mm -hmm. continue uh, you know to do our, our part so yeah I mean um, yeah yeah sorry I That's we sorry. went on this tangent but you were talking about the community that you experienced uh, in Stanford yeah that sense of community yeah, I mean, like anyone who's went to college, uh, it's a pivotal time in terms of how you kind of 
their formative years where you're really building your perspective on life, your purpose, rethinking like a lot of stuff that maybe you grew up with in terms of like, do I really believe this? Uh, you know, if I believe it, why do I believe it? Yeah. And it was so important to be in a space where you're able to dissect those things and talk to people and learn from people. And the Stanford Muslim community is extremely diverse because not only do you have uh, Muslims uh, from the United States, but also abroad, international students, undergrad and grad students. And so you see the the um, the beautiful colors of Islam in terms of how Islam is practiced and coming together and talking about things in, a, in an environment that encourages um, dialogue, right? And I think also tied to that was um, that, um, you know, our, our deen is not uh, void of, of action, right? Uh, it's always uh, the believers are those <laughs> those who believe and do good, right? And so I remember, I mean, nearly every weekend we were doing something. I would say many quarters we were spending more time on, uh, you know, activism work than uh, my studies. So kind of the post 9-11 yeah. uh, era, um, and it was it was an important time because it was a time where uh, a lot of people were uh, looking to get answers from Muslims here. And it was a time for a lot of Muslims to have some introspection and define what does it mean for me to be a Muslim and what does that look like? And so um, that really uh, was important on a college campus. Um, it was also uh, it, it good for me to be around that. So, you know, sometimes you get sidetracked with a lot of the college activities, kind of the, the things that happen, social activities. So it's really good for me to be surrounded by uh, people who shared the same values. And yeah. Um, and yeah, mashallah, I mean, uh, not only did we have like an MSA, it's called the Islamic Society of Stanford University, it was since the 50s, uh, but we also had, you know, other organizations focused on different things, whether they be around community service or activism, political activism or uh, cultural groups. And so, um, again, it was a beautifully diverse uh, group. And those are like lifelong relationships that I can, you know, continue to have and, and uh, they're like uh, brothers and sisters to me. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, it was, alhamdulillah, it was uh, a great decision for me. I would, looking back, uh, to pursue my studies there and, and be surrounded by folks like like people in the Muslim community. This is going to come up later, so I'm asking now. Just in all these years, you have been in the United States up until this point. So you know you're, you're in college. Have you gone back to the Middle East at all? Have you gone back home? Have you, you know whether it's Kuwait, whether it's Palestine? Have you ever visited? Yeah, great question. So. You know, whereas people like to say, you know, it's easy for refugees to come and like take over and take our jobs. It's very, very difficult. I actually didn't become a citizen until 2005. I didn't get the green card until late 1999. It took us about 10 years yeah. to get a green card. So we had to go through refugee status, political asylum. Right. Then, you know, every year you'd go and do an immigration interview and they say, come back next year. It's like, okay, well, that's another year now you know, can't get a job. Like my father couldn't get a job. His knowledge was outdated, you know, by the time we, yeah. we could, uh, he could get a job. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it took until 2005 to become a citizen. So we never really traveled, nor did we have the luxury of traveling. I mean, we didn't have the finances, yeah, uh, yeah. to travel. So my, actually my first, um, trip back was, uh, I got married in 2006, um, uh, to my wife, Naima. And uh, we were young. I was 21 and she was 18 going on 19. And um, so I was waiting for your wife to be mentioned because, yeah. I mean, like this show would not have been possible without yeah. the, uh, the the help of your in-laws. Um, yeah. Shout out to Dr. Dean, uh, who's a friend of mine, as well as our, our family dentist <laughs> and uh, somebody, you know, we've known for quite some time. So very respected. He's your father-in-law. Yes. And a very yeah. respected family in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Not only your father-in-law, but your sisters and brother-in-laws are all, mashallah, very famous in the Bay Area. So anyway, so I wanted to just a quick mention since they came up just yeah, now. Yeah. And actually the first time I, I met my father-in-law was at Stanford because he had his practice at in the, yeah. uh, on the Stanford campus, yeah. and he would come to Juma at Stanford, as many you know local folks uh, do, and um, 
if you know my father-in-law, he always has a big smile on his face. He's yeah. very uh, loving. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, uh, you know, interestingly, I actually, I was giving like a little workshop at SBIA uh, in college. And that's where Naima, my wife, had seen me. And uh, she had she has such a close relationship with her father after that event she said can you find out about this guy <laughs> Muhammad Suba. actually initially she thought my name was Muhammad Sudais <laughs> so I was like who's Muhammad Sudais uh, so then he reached out to a good friend of mine in in uh, at Stanford and um from there we you know got to know each other we actually got married like about two and a half months later and um wow. alhamdulillah I mean it's like uh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in in, in decisions uh that you never imagine happen and so um you know uh, my first time going back to the middle east was um to umrah my um, actually uh my wife uh, it was our honeymoon uh, quote unquote but it was i it took my wife and my mother who hadn't gone back i had never wow. done umrah and we all went together we actually initially visited kuwait we visited all our family in kuwait yeah. and uh for almost a week and then um went and did umrah uh, for the first time for all of us and um it was uh it was an amazing experience uh, uh to have that and um you know i it was uh again it was it, you don't realize the the blessing of being able to travel and to do the things mobility the freedom of mobility is so important and it's taken away from a lot of people i'll be honest i mean just, when i asked the question uh, you know, and then hearing you beginning your answer sort of checked my privilege just because I, you know, my parents came here legally. They had, you know, immigration status right from the very, you know, the time they stepped foot on American soil. So even my question was just, you know, and I, and I apologize, yeah. but you, you forget the ability, the, 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 the freedom of mobility being such a privilege. And uh, yeah, so, so thank you for mentioning that. And yeah, kind oh, of a, thank you for like I said, a privilege me. check for for, for, yeah. for for those of us who never had that consideration. Like for me, I, I went back home all the time. My parents did, my family did, um, because they could, <laughs> number one. Mm-hmm. Number two, of course, financial means, like you mentioned. Uh, so yeah, wow, subhanAllah. But anyway, sorry. Yeah. Um, Umrah, wow. So the, your first travel overseas, as it were. Yeah, is to, yeah, it was is amazing to, too, to because... Uh, one of my uh, greatest memories from the Umrah was also doing tawaf with uh, uh, Imam Suhaib Webb and Sheikh uh, Muhammad Faqih, and uh, kind of flanked by, wow. you know, on both sides. And I remember it got so like uh, packed around the Kaaba. They actually like we crossed arms and almost lifted me up. And <laughs> was this both, when um, Imam Suhaib was Imam at MCA? He was. Uh, he was at the MCA. He was at the MCA yeah. at the time. Okay. Yeah. 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 And so uh, that was one of my best memories going <laughs> to Amran. It's like, does this tawaf count if they're carrying me? <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was a great time, alhamdulillah. And um, I mean, also one of one of the best things about it was I was able to take my mom. Yeah. But always, every time I remember, she would uh, turn on uh, the Jum'a khutbah at the Haram on uh in our on our tv in los angeles and watch and cry every time she saw the kaaba and saw the people there she always made dua to go and mm. so i surprised her you know mm. actually the day before we left uh, my Mashallah. dad my dad told her okay you gotta pack your bag because she's like where am i going and then he said to umro uh, muhammad and naima so beautiful yeah, Mashallah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. yeah god bless you Mashallah. that's beautiful yeah. We don't want to bury the lead. We definitely want to obviously talk about your most recent trip. I, I guess, well, you, you touched on this, so I, I do want you to maybe say something about that specifically, and then we'll and then we'll talk about your trip, which is obviously medicine. But why specifically ER? You touched on it earlier with the with fascination as a young boy, uh, the, like the helicopter land mm. and take off. But um, yeah, I'm just curious, like, because I know that line of work is very, very demanding. My sister-in-law, both sides. So my my brother's wife and then my wife's sister are both ER physicians, mm. um, and uh, that's not an easy life, and it's it's tough. And, and you see, it's traumatic because obviously, not everybody makes it. In fact, my my sister-in-law, you know, my my brother's w- uh, wife, she was trained at um, you know Chicago Cook County, mm-hmm. which is like the epicenter for gunshot victims and everything else uh 
and you having spent time in Chicago, I imagine yeah. you, you you know that. So yeah, why ER specifically, and and if you can maybe touch on that a little. Yeah, um, I, I mean, so as part of your medical training, all medical students are required to take obviously rotations, core rotations, and really explore what what do you like, what you don't like, uh, where you see kind of yourself contributing, like. 20, 30, 40 years of your, the rest of your life. Uh, um, and so, um, one of the things that always, you know, on my rotations, I really enjoyed everything. I, I saw that I, I, I enjoyed, you know, the ICU, I enjoyed pediatrics, I enjoyed OBGYN, I enjoyed, um, uh, you know, just all the different types of specialties. And that really culminated in emergency medicine. Emergency medicine requires you to know really everything about the body right. and to also it requires you to know what you need to do quickly to save lives and save limbs and um, the other big part of it is it's a team effort you realize it's not just you know it's not a doctor making the decisions it's a it's everybody working together nursing staff ancillary staff to make sure that patient survives and that we do everything to to try to get them um, you know not only save people's lives, but, um, uh, you know, make, make sure that we're doing no harm and make sure that we're able to get them to a better state than when they came to us, right? If you had a stroke or something, how can we save your brain uh, tissue so that you can regain full function, right? Right. And so that was a big part of the draw for me. It, it draws a certain type of uh, person, right, to work in the emergency department. And then the other big part is uh, it, it constantly reminds you of your mortality and it constantly reminds you that despite everything you do, sometimes the outcome doesn't change. And um, it, it's that concept of tawakkul. You really have to have tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and realize that everything is in Allah's hands and uh, not be too hard on yourself if it, the outcome is not what you expected, right? And so it really uh, humbles you to work in the emergency department. Grace under pressure is probably right. the right term. You probably mm -hmm. got to be right. be able to handle that situation with calm and yeah. grace, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Like seeing, uh, you know, like training uh, on the south side of Chicago. Um, <laughs> you know, seeing uh, when the temperature would turn sixty sixty five degrees. Yeah, code yellows would go off. Code yellows were our trauma activations, and you'd see sometimes dozens of people coming in with gunshot wounds right. and being able to be very systematic and meticulous about how you're managing each patient uh, and doing doing your best, mm -hmm. right? That's all that's expected is you do your best, you are operating within standards of care, you're working as a team and, um, and just remembering like, you know, uh, the outcome inshallah is, is a positive one, but if it's not, then it's really out of your hands. And is that what you meant by a certain type of person, someone who can go in with that type of mindset? Yeah, because if you don't have that mindset, it can be very paralyzing mm -hmm. and it can really, uh, it can debilitate you. I mean, it can really take a toll on you emotionally, psychologically, uh, and, and physically, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you may end up doing more harm to the patient, actually trying to achieve an outcome that's not going to happen. Um, and so, yeah, um, that was a big draw for me in emergency medicine. The other part is my ability to take those skill sets and be able to, um, you know, serve uh, communities abroad. That was mm -hmm. very important that I'm not, you know, just settled here in California and working in one spot and uh, not contributing to the uh, and you know, bettering the health of those abroad because was, we are very privileged to have the access to care that we do have. Was that a, was that a consideration even when you were in med school uh, early on? Uh, like when you're selecting your, your, your specialty? Actually, my first, uh, I think internally I decided I wanted to go into medicine from high school. Mm. And from that time, I always had this desire to go and help people abroad. Um, and, and not only, I mean, I would say there's bi there are big needs in communities here in the United States. That's uh, there's no doubt about it, and I experienced it. Like uh, access to healthcare in our community was very difficult, and my <laughs> parents had chronic conditions, and unfortunately, my father passed away from complications of diabetes. And so, um, 
but uh, I also uh, knew of the um, the pains that are experienced in other other parts of the world, and so that was always a big draw for me. I wasn't tied to like one mm-hmm. one area. Mm-hmm. Um, so all those were reasons for me to go into emergency medicine. And actually, when I was training in Chicago, the hospital. So I worked at the University of Chicago as well as Mount Sinai and and up in Evanston. Um, uh, you know, uh, Mount Sinai was the number one penetrating trauma center in all of the United States. It was second to Johannesburg, South Africa, in terms of penetrating trauma. It was, uh, I mean, it was wow. nuts. Uh, and where's Mount penet- Sinai? It's the west side of Chicago. West side. Yeah, just, okay. uh, just west of Cook County and Rush oh. and UIC. Okay. Um, and alhamdulillah, and I was a flight physician as well, actually. It turned out that I could, uh, I ended up being a flight <laughs> physician on the helicopter for University of Chicago. Oh, there you go. Wow. And so it kind of like, yeah. uh, it was like this, uh, you know. Full circle. Full circle back yeah. to those helicopters landing in my elementary school and doing scene calls and picking up patients, uh, trauma patients. And, you know, not only that, we were picking up ICU patients and um, from taking them from hospital to hospital. And uh, it was such a great uh, great experience for me. When were you there? Um, there's a reason I asked this. I was there from 2012 to 2015. Okay. Okay. Cause you, yeah. you, you mentioned losing your father. I, I lost my father to complications from heart or, you know, mm. heart related, uh, disease, uh, cardi- cardiovascular disease at the university of Chicago. Oh, subhanAllah. Yeah. So he was there um, for a transplant. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you were there. <laughs> you know what? Well, this was 2008. So 2008. before you, I don't know if you were getting somewhere, but I was going to ask before we actually also as to, to just set the stage or context for the trip to Gaza, have you traveled, had you traveled at all prior to that going overseas? Yeah. So that was, I mean, I meaning, tra- meaning for, for, for to actual provide care. Yeah. Oh, for, Sorry, uh, no. no, no. So, um, you know, the unfortunate thing about uh, a lot of medical missions is, uh, I mean, fortunate and unfortunate yeah. is that they really want a certain level of expertise or training or experience before you're deployed, uh, definitely to work independently. Right. Yeah. Um, a- as it should be. Um, but also, you know, uh, you don't want to be a burden on the mission or the the group, right? Right. Um, and when you say they, I think this is also going to help the, the, sure. the listeners understand the context. There are organizations that facilitate this, right? Yes. Can you talk yeah. a little about that? Yeah, there's several. Um, I imagine several. people have heard of like Doctors Without Borders, yes. but I mean, there yeah. must be several others. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's uh, a lot of small and large organizations that have uh, missions all over the world. Some groups, so for example, I, I, uh, my son Ahmed and I volunteer every year. Uh, uh, we go to El Salvador and we have a week of kind of makeshift clinics in, in different villages in El Salvador. And that's through a local organization called the Castaneda Kids Foundation, where one of our medics started it. Um, he's Salvadorian and uh, started it to serve the population there. And so um, that's a small group focused exclusively on El Salvador, exclusively on, you know, we definitely do the, the medical mission as well as education, kind of sponsor mm. children to go to school and, and nutrition and so on. And then you have big organizations that are, uh, you know, global NGOs mm. that, you know, may have 30 missions going on at the same time. And so um, it just depends on the mission mm-hmm. and what their needs are and where you can get plugged into, um, you know, to serve. Yeah, thank you for all of that. I mean, I guess uh, now is as good as a time as any to talk about your trip. I mean, I, I was, if you don't mind, I mean, I was, just to kind of situate where we are, obviously so much has happened in this conflict, but I wanted to just sort of, you know, to provide some context to our listeners, you know, as of today, as of March 29th, in Gaza, at least 32,623 32, people uh, have been killed, including uh, 13,000 children, 8,400 women, uh, more than 75,000 people injured, the vast majority of those being children and women, more than 8,000 missing. This is related to, I imagine, the work you were doing. The World Health Organization has said that more than 300 attacks have taken place on healthcare facilities in Gaza since the start of the war. Uh, and also the WHO also says that fewer than half of hospitals in Gaza are even partially functional. Um, and there's numbers and statistics for the West Bank as well that, you know, the media doesn't talk a lot about, but it's happening in the West Bank as well. Um, so I guess just to kind of like, as I said, these uh, a sad context or 
pretext to our conversation around uh, your trip. I guess what prompted, I mean, it's probably not even a question worth asking, but what really allowed you to make that decision that this is something you wanted to do and at this time? And I guess part of that, uh, or just to add to that is, was it something that was what was going on? Like the news basically triggered this thought or was it something that you would, you were already considering doing something and then this just made it, you know, to a reality? What, what was just to add on to Perez's question? What was the, what was the context to actually make you make such a big uh, decision? Yeah. So, um, I, I should say I have family in Gaza. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, aunt, cousins, their children, all in Gaza were in Northern Gaza. And, um, you know, I'd been in touch with my family, you know, for years mm -hmm. and um and really uh, when you talk to people in Gaza prior to October you understand the 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 healthcare system wasn't all that great to begin with and there there were big needs uh uh big gaps in in, in terms of access to certain services and uh care you know two and a half million people living in a stretch of land 25 by 6 miles right um and uh uh, under siege, there's a lot of limitations in terms of what could get in, uh, necessary supplies, and um, and people don't realize that. Like uh, the the healthcare infrastructure in Gaza prior to October was already very difficult, and so actually, you know, from talking to my family, uh, I've been speaking with Naima, my wife, about going and setting up some sort of clinic or working within uh, any system or hospital to provide extra care. And what that look, you know, what would that look like? And what are the biggest needs? Um, and so we were kind of brainstorming ways that we would, um, we could help there on the ground. Yeah. Um, when October happened, it was kind of, uh, again, a no brainer for me, like, okay, we got to find a way for me to get there and to help. Because from the outset, you could see the uh, deliberate targeting of the healthcare infrastructure. It was, it was, like you couldn't deny it clear you know? as day yeah and and you know initially people got caught up in the back and forth about well who bombed this hospital was it this group was it that group and then you know the subsequent month you see the destruction of hospital after hospital after hospital exactly. uh the israeli forces going in killing doctors killing nurses abducting healthcare workers and uh, that's a violation of international law in and of itself, you know. And can, and can I ask real quick, in the medical community, are do you feel in, in the U.S. amongst like the non-Muslim, non-Palestinian community, uh, are doctors and and so forth, are they seeing this and taking it personally? Or is there a kind of a, a are there blinders on from the, from the perspective of the non-Muslim, non-Palestinian yeah. doctors? Great question. I think in the beginning... People, there, there's always this fear of, of um, I don't want to be involved in politics, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, but this is not a political issue. This is a, a humanitarian issue. <coughs> this has implications on what does it mean to have kind of off-limit mm -hmm. uh, structures and spaces uh, anywhere in the world. And so what I've found, at least in the past couple of months, actually, there has been a change in the tide in terms of, you know, non-Muslim healthcare workers being like, hey, this is not okay. Right. At, to the point where, I mean, it, it really has caught me off guard. I mean, I'm very surprised by how 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 vocal people have become. Um, and so um, there is a, a, an awakening in terms of what does this mean for all of us? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, us and, you know, folks in healthcare that are working in healthcare, we're not really tied to any particular, we don't think, oh, uh, I'm a U.S. doctor mm -hmm. or I'm a, you know, e you know, uh, you know, German doctor, you know, Ethiopian doctor, or whatnot. We're just doctors there to help mm -hmm. people that need the help that you know mm -hmm. uh, that we we can provide. Yeah. And so, I think there has been a shift in terms of uh, people not only being aware but forming their own opinion about what does this mean for me, and then the next stage is really being vocal about it mm, and mm. taking stances. You know, that's that's good to hear because just as a side note, in the tech space where I work or Perez works as well, um, you don't have that, yeah. unfortunately. And I think, as I think about it, it's because the tech industry is in Israel, mm -hmm. right? So, they're dealing, there's business dealings with Israel. They're kind of, again, the out of sight, out of mind when it comes to Palestine side. So, just a, just an observation there yeah. that there's a big difference based on the fact that they yeah. can't empathize 
uh, with their counterparts. The the other part of it is there's a, a big fear of retaliation, and um, unfortunately, there's um, you know. Uh, and by retaliation, you mean like doxing and so on. Doxing. Yeah. There's yeah. a Zionist effort to sure. uh, really silence people. I mean, I I was uh, I was threatened several times by people very high within emergency medicine physicians, Zionist physicians that have you know. Um, you know, uh, defamed me on LinkedIn um, and uh, called me things that I, were mind boggling, uh, threatened that I would never get a, a job in the United States again. And um, but the risk comes from Allah, mm -hmm. your blessings, your, your, you know, your sustenance comes from Allah. And you just you have to operate with that mindset. Mm -hmm. um, it, it should not stop us from speaking the truth and being upstanders because that's what's expected of us, right? It's mm -hmm. a privilege to even be able to speak out, right? Right. And so that was a big thing for me. Like uh, it was just one means for me to, uh, uh, you know, to 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 uh, give light to what's happening in Gaza. So when, you know, I, I kind of going back to your question about how I decided to go, um, uh, I, I applied to several NGOs and groups that I knew were operating on the ground. Uh, many of them were trying to figure out how they can best contribute, right? Still doing needs assessments and trying to figure out where where do we place ourselves and trying to balance that out with safety and, and so on. And, um, you know, one of my other goals was to also not just go for a week or two. Uh, I felt like that wasn't sufficient. I, I really wanted to go for a lot longer. So I was very lucky, alhamdulillah, um, when, um, you know, I got the opportunity to go with uh, International Medical Corps. Mm -hmm. So uh, they operate out of, uh, currently serve in 30 countries, 30 missions, and um, very well organized. And, uh, you know, I went on a five-week mission, essentially. Um, and so it gave me enough time to, you know, contribute. Uh, I felt, you know, substantially to the efforts there on the ground. And to establish uh, processes and systems that could be scaled up, and that's what really what I focus my efforts on the the week and a half or two, my last week and a half or so. Mm -hmm. um, and, so and let's dive into that. Like, where exactly, where exactly well, did you go? I, I mean, I, I was even going to ask. I mean, this is going to kind of nerd out on the logistical side of things, but are, are is like is an organization like International Medical Corps? Are they funded or do the physicians or medical staff that go on these um, uh, missions, do they fund themselves? Yeah. So all the NGOs are funded. Uh -huh. uh, In the sense that funders. they can at least provide you yeah. a stipend or, right, or uh, uh, yeah. transportation, whatever may be the so case. So it varies by the NGO. Okay. Um, their funding, um, funding sources vary also, you know, lots of private donors institutional donors, um, government aid, you know, like USAID uh, donations. And so it, it depends on the NGO and, and kind of what the, their objective is with, with the work that they're doing. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so we ended up uh, establishing a field hospital in the northern part of Rafah. Um, Rafah, as you know, is on the southern port, southern part of the Strip, the right. Gaza Strip. And we were a couple blocks away from Khan Yunus. And, um, and so the field hospital was really aimed at the anticipated volume was about maybe 40 patients that we'd be managing. And, uh, the week I left, we were seeing up to a thousand patients a day. So, which is substantial <laughs> increase and, uh, really had to scale up to be able to provide, uh, the services, uh, you know, life-saving, uh, uh, therapies to people. Did it, the numbers go up during that period? Do you know, because of military incursions that were happening to the North and people were being forced because we, we, you know, we're hearing about people essentially being forced into the Rafa, like, and, and at the, at the Rafa crossing, you know, in the hopes either that Egypt will open up the other side or the fact that, you know, that's what they've been told, right? Mm -hmm. Go to the South, go to the South, you're safe there. So, you know, I'm putting this in air quotes. Yeah. So is that, is that why you think there was an increase in the week, just in the weeks that you were there? Well, I think there is a baseline high need for healthcare Got right? it. that was inaccessible at other hospitals. And like you mentioned, most hospitals are non-functional. The hospitals that have been in Gaza, you know, built in Gaza, yeah. I think there's about maybe 12 that are uh, operational right now and yeah and actually the are, numbers of, going back to the the same site is 10 out of 35 hospitals yeah. are partially functioning yeah 
Um, so it's crazy. So, you know, and a lot of these hospitals may not be able to provide all services, there you go. emergency services. Yeah. And on top of that, they're uh, housing internally displaced people, right? And trying to uh, run on whatever supplies they have, De you know, very deplete inventory of supplies and medicines and whatnot. 360,000 residential units have been destroyed. Yeah. So we're talking mass displacement. Yeah, I mean, people. we had a million and a half people uh -huh. in Rafah. It's it's a tiny, tiny strip of land. So people don't know, Gaza is the size of two thirds the city of San Jose. There you go. And then divide that by five and take one strip of that, and that's where a million and a half people are internally displaced. And 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 Rafah housed, you know, it had about two hundred to two hundred fifty thousand residents prior to prior. October. Yeah. Um, so you can imagine driving through the streets or walking through the streets, tent encampments everywhere, people torn up clothes, looking for food, scavenging, kids scavenging through trash, trying to find whatever foods uh, they can get their hands on or whatever things, they toys they can play with, things that they could build. How about debris? Um, is the debris just still there? I mean, because everywhere. 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 And, and the other thing is when I, when I was there. Because there's no locus of military activity. It's everywhere. It, it is everywhere and, just, and concentrated at different times and in, in different locations. So when I was there, wow. it was on Khan Yunus. So constant yeah, bombardment. Right. Like I said, it's two blocks away. Khan Yunus plus Rafa. Rafa actually has been, <laughs> it's been bombed since October. So people for, it wasn't like, you know, Rafa has off limits and then they'll exactly. enter Rafa. Rafa was bombed constantly actually. And, um, and uh, that's the one thing you don't actually appreciate when you're looking at these pictures and videos like when you're there you get that that um you're inhaling all this dust from the explosives and the rubble and you're you know you're hearing constant missile strikes and these missile strikes aren't just coming from the f-16s flying over they're coming from these quadcopters which are like drones with high definition cameras outfitted with machine guns and missiles and will target individuals so i mean i and the other part that people don't realize is you know, there's this term of like indiscriminate bombing, right? First, it was like, well, there's precision bombing. No, mm -hmm. no, they they know their target. Surgical, so to speak. And then it's you know it's indiscriminate. And how could they indiscriminate, right? I mean, I've, I've met with Congress people like it's indiscriminate. And then you realize, well, when you're there, it's not indiscriminate. It's deliberate. Mm -hmm. Like you'll have a group like at a group of ten uh, folks uh, trying to find firewood, including children, because they use it for heating, they use it to cook, and a quadcopter came above their head and shot at them. Um, I had a 13 year old boy sleeping in his tent and got shot in the chest, arm, chest, an eight year old girl playing outside her tent shot in the abdomen. Um, and so this becomes like, it's not like a one-off story, right? It's like every day. And so, um, going back to the, the increase in the need, the increase in the need is because increasing traumatic injuries, okay. increasing infection rates. Hepatitis A became rampant. Uh, people would come in with severe dehydration. You know, you have lack of access to uh, adequate, like clean water. And then compound that with the fact that you're vomiting, you're having diarrhea, you're severely dehydrated. And it just spirals out of control, especially if you have chronic conditions, you have diabetes. Now you go into diabetic ketoacidosis, you build up acid in your bloodstream, and that can be fatal for people. Um, and then you have. Um, you know, you're looking for things in the trash, you cut your hand, now you have an infection of your hand, you have an infection of your feet because you have no shoes and you're getting cuts in your feet. Um, and then kind of the the normal things we would see also in, here in our ERs, appendicitis, gallbladder issues, pneumonias, um, kidney disease, uh, strokes, uh, sepsis, heart attacks. You're gonna, you know, we saw a mm -hmm. lot of that and it just mm -hmm. increased more because of lack of access to adequate preventative care. I imagine, you know, you, you say, you know, normal things, pregnancies, deliveries. 100%. I mean, you imagine going through, uh, living through this time um, where uh, everything's being withheld from you, not getting prenatal care. And then most of these women are delivering prematurely and uh, very limited spaces for them to deliver. We actually ha set up a tent for um, kind of a makeshift maternity ward. We were delivering up to 20 babies a day, 10 to 20 babies a day. Mm. And so um, uh, there, it, it, it's, um, 
it's extremely difficult because also when you're delivering premature babies, there are a lot of complications that could happen that would lead to infant mortality uh, or maternal mortality. And you need to have, you know, the appropriate services, neonatal intensive care unit and whatnot accessible to you to be able to resuscitate the babies. And we don't, we don't have those. And um, medications, you know, the medica when you approach Rafah, there are mild, by the way, it's a very tedious journey to go from Cairo to Rafah. And I wanted uh, to ask about that. that. Yeah, I wanted to ask how in? you got there and what, what does the border experience? You can't get in or out without clearance from the Israeli yeah. uh, authorities. Okay. And so actually our clearance, which is one of the reasons my, my trip was postponed a little bit. Uh, I was like on the way to the airport the prior week and they oh. said they turned me back is you need uh, official clearances and you need to be assigned to a specific convoy to enter. And the convoys only enter on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, and so when you get clearances, you... Um, These convoys are bringing supplies? No, they're uh -huh. bringing personnel like Just United personnel. Nations, okay. or World Food Program and other, uh, you, know, uh, right. you know, authorities entering um, right. Gaza. And so, uh, the, you know, you leave at about 4.30 in the morning uh, from Cairo. And if you were doing a straight shot to Rafa, it'd probably be a like five and a half, half hour trip, like going to LA from mm -hmm. San Jose. Um, but it takes double the amount of time because as soon as you uh, enter the Sinai Peninsula, it's a heavily militarized landmass, lots of checkpoints, asking you the same questions, confirming your clearances. And so it takes quite some time to get across. As you approach Rafa, you're met with miles upon miles of these eight trucks that have been waiting there some for months, yeah. just waiting for clearance to enter. And those eight trucks, if you're not familiar with the clearance, because a lot of people, including our Congress people, like ever since I returned, I realized how little our elected officials know no. about the processes. So true. And um, those eight trucks have to check in in Rafa in the Egyptian side. Then they go to a, a town on the eastern portion called Kerem Shalom, which is an Israeli town, checkpoint. And there, depending on when the officials want to uh, search the trucks, they'll search them. They'll determine what they want to allow in, what they don't want to allow in. And um, and then when they want to allow that eight truck in. Right. So, you know, whereas... You know, Gaza was heavily dependent on aid prior to October and was getting 500 plus aid trucks in daily. Now there's about 30 to 40 yeah. aid trucks going in when the need is exponentially higher than what it was before October. And so it takes a long time to get access to medicines with like, like an inventory that's constantly depleting because people need those medicines. Like I didn't have access to Tylenol or ibuprofen for almost a week. So imagine these kids coming in with febrile seizures, right. have no way to bring down their temperature, um, pain control. You know, the only access I had to like anesthetics was ketamine, which is a dissociative medicine. It kind of like dissociates the mind and the body. Um, we were doing, you know, chest tubes just with ketamine, opening chests, opening abdomens. Um, if I were to do that here in the United States, that would be inhumane inhumane and unethical but the, the the reality is without that people would die like you're really making difficult decisions that you're not trained even after going through um you know i would say a very robust training program at the university of chicago you're not really uh trained to see something like that and and you know many of my colleagues that were there with me who had just been deployed to ukraine south sudan and other locations they were mind boggled by what they were seeing because even in those areas, it was a fraction, like they had not experienced even a fraction of what they were experiencing in Gaza in terms of the withholding of supplies, but also the types of traumatic injuries right? and the disproportionate effect on the civilian population. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, it was extremely yeah. difficult to operate under those conditions. And you were just kind of at the whim of when yeah. they I would mean, allow these supplies in. All the factors you just described, I think if even if one of those factors were, were affecting another region, it would completely debilitate the infrastructure, the healthcare system of that of that of that region. 
you're talking about all of these multiple factors are all happening at the same time. Like yes. you said, a highly dense civilian population matched with tra traumatic injuries that you're seeing. That So any one of these factors, not to mention the limited supplies, um, the constant threat to life and limb for people who are working there. So, I mean, again, there's just... The starvation, yeah, the, right. The the deliberate starvation of the population, right? When there's food just a few miles away, I, uh, I think you, you, like you mentioned a number earlier, and I want people just to sort of pause and think about that. Eight hundred plus trucks were coming in daily, and that was just sort of boring. Plus. I'm sorry, five hundred yeah. plus, and now you're down to about thirty. And like you're saying, these could some of these trucks are just at the border for months. It could be well into 2025, even by the time they get entry. Some of these. So I mean, they can just, all enter today, right? The literal, it, literally, um, like these air airdrops are are in some sadistic manner. It goes back to that story you mentioned about your father <laughs> and that military official. You're at the whim and the fancy of just you know an individual, or in this case, a government. That if they choose to let these people in, it'll happen. Otherwise, like supplies, convoy, uh, you know, convoys, whatever. You're at the whim of of, of just this brutal you know government yeah yeah and it's, that wants it's, nothing more than to brutalize the population you know it's it's heartbreaking as a human being just, right uh just seeing that like it uh, seeing babies coming in malnourished it's like that should that should not happen should not. children should not starve nobody should starve to death it's uh it's like in, in in some of these children you know their families have been killed in front of them they're orphans and now you're withholding food and now they're dying a slow, painful death from starvation. And if you don't know what starvation does to your body, your body starts breaking down internal organs and going through a catabolic state. You know, breaking down muscle to provide fuel. You're breaking down, you know, brain tissue. And so it's like eating at you, eating at you until, you know, your body just has uh, no reserves anymore. Um, it's inhumane, and especially in 2024 to to see that this is being allowed to happen on kind of a global stage yeah. with like live streamed is, um, is heartbreaking mainly because you think that human beings are better than that. Now, yeah. you know, right. where, yeah. where we are, yeah. where we're at and kind of the, the, the timeline of history. I think people who live in times of huge, like global, uh, you know, tumult don't realize when they're living in the moment but 20 years from now, you know, or whatever, when the books are written, you know, we are witnessing a, a humanitarian crisis that is once in a lifetime, if not more. And so, you know, we, we, we're almost like not desensitized, but you're an, you know, because it's so ubiquitous because of social media and everything, there is a tendency to just like, you're able to kind of quote unquote, turn it off, but you know, it's happening. And and it's just mind blowing. I mean, it's just literally mind boggling. I don't, I don't have the words. I mean, I don't have the words because I'm, I'm fasting, but on top of it, I just don't have the ability to convey the feeling, the emotions that it takes to just, you know, you know, of what is, of what we're witnessing, what is happening. So the fact that you were there, I mean, tell us a little bit about your, like the colleagues, who are your colleagues there? Yeah, I had, this, I had the exact same yeah. question about right. the doctors. You mentioned a lot of doctors right. who had previously done this sort of work. Are they from all around the world? Are they from America, Europe? And I, I, and, and then yeah. even, I'm even curious, um, after you talk about that, even what are you seeing on the ground aside from doctors? Are you seeing journalists? Are you And, and who are they? And I, I mean, I have so many questions, honestly. So many questions. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So uh, in terms of journalists, no, I, I don't see journalists because they're not allowed in. Mm. So the, the journalists are really the folks that you would see on social media. Uh, mm. that are this was probably before you left, but do you remember there was that crew, that CNN crew that was allowed? Uh, very briefly, they yeah. were allowed in. Right. And, and you got to remember, like, their, uh, Israel uh, limits what they can publish. Right. right? right. has to be uh, presented to Israeli authorities prior to publishing. Exactly. Even so, what made the airways yeah. was just shocking yeah. for a lot of Americans. That was the first time they saw that. And then number two, this was earlier, I think, when there was that nurse and, and she was being interviewed. I forget. I think it was like she mm -hmm. made this. She made the rounds, mm -hmm. but she had spent time there. And they, I think, it went viral because they asked her, "Would you go back?" And she said, "In a heartbeat." Yeah. I, I think you probably remember that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you definitely have um, 
you have people that are uh, coming from abroad to okay. serve. Yeah. Uh, doctors. I, I think uh, uh, there was another uh, surgeon with me from Chicago uh, while I was there uh, and a few doctors from other countries. Um, and uh, the rest, what we actually try to do, aim to do is you have an amazing healthcare workforce in Gaza, very talented individuals. And so what we did is really uh, brought on board the majority of the staff were uh, doctors and nurses and techs from uh, from Gaza mm. and built the teams uh, kind of in, internal to Gaza. And I think it, that's such an important part because like, you know, there's only so much that an international doctor can do long term mm -hmm. coming for a month on end or a couple months on end. Really, the goal is to continue to uplift the uh, uh, the Gazan physicians and nurses and staff to be able to do the work that's needed there on the ground. Albeit they were, you know, you can imagine the physical and mental exhaustion of having to go through six months working day in and day out, seeing the atrocities. They actually helped me more than I feel like I helped them in terms of grounding me, helping me focus. Like the first week for me was extremely difficult. Like seeing the number of children dead, hearing the cries of moms, seeing their, you know, dead children's bodies, um, you know, uh, I get these mule drawn carriages with bodies on top of each other and having to pick each one up and try to figure out, is this somebody's skull? Is this, you know, what body part is this? And putting them in body bags, seeing, you know, responding to mass casualty incidents, trying to color code people, determining who gets the scarce resources that we have and who doesn't. That is extremely difficult. And I would say that um, having, like, working alongside uh, physicians and nurses from Gaza was what kept me kind of focused on why I was there. And they tell me, Alhamdulillah, uh, you know, they would call me Abu Ahmed, Abu Ahmed, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, it's okay. You know, this is from Allah. And, uh, and you know, just kind of redirecting me or, you know, giving me a hug. You know, these were these are like my brothers and sisters. Like I have such a deep connection with them right now. Um, you hear about the piety. Can you talk a little about that? I mean, you know, humans are not <laughs> meant to suffer this much, right? And they are, and they're doing it, and they're and they're, you still see them holding on to their their deen. Can you talk a little about that? You know, a salient feature of our faith is the belief in miracles and the belief in the unseen. I mean, I imagine in a in a in a situation like that if there's anything that you're comfortable sharing that just sort of defies, you know what I mean? Like the believable. And mm. I think what Omar is kind of getting to with the question even, I mean, this is beyond what normal human beings have the ability to bear. And of course, as Allah says, I mean, you know, that you, you no soul shall bear the I mean, a burden beyond its scope, but you can't even imagine the level of humanity that it takes for people to rise to that level, like mm. you're saying. Um, but I also have a question that I wanted to come back to about how you're, you're, you yourself are dealing with it, but maybe kind of, I guess, answering these two qu uh, questions in tandem, if you can. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you know, working with people in Gaza, you quickly realize that their mindset is they're living day to day. Uh, they, they understand what they have control over, what they don't have control over, and they're at peace with that. I mean, we would do these like daily huddles that I started, ha you know, halfway in my mission where we bring like the night team and the day team and we'd talk about what's going well, what do we need to improve on, review a case and learn together. Mm. Constantly missile strikes near us and it would really, I would get startled, right? Say it's okay. Uh, Abu Ahmed, it's okay. You know, and just, is this in English or in Arabic? Uh, in Arabic, in my broken Arabic. <laughs> okay. And and they were very gracious. Okay. And they're like, hey, if you want to talk in, in English, but I, I didn't. I pushed myself, which was a great experience for me. But, How about um, some of these other colleagues yeah. that are there from other countries and stuff you mentioned? What's theirs? Like, what's sort of the demographic? Muslim, you know, people of other faiths? Muslim, non-Muslim. Non okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all, yeah all, all languages, all, all creeds. languages, yeah. you know, coming from. Uh, you know, uh, Europe, from African countries, from the Middle East, uh, everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so... Um, so sorry. Yeah. Because uh, I meant to ask that earlier. So, um, the, and they're just comforting you. Yeah. And, and, and not Let's only comforting that. me, giving me perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And saying like, it's, you know, this is the reality. We're trapped here. Our goal, our focus is on helping the people. 
And by you worrying so much about things you don't have control over, it's taking you away from doing what what you're <laughs> meant to do, your purpose of why you're there. Right. And, uh, you know, if if we die, it's in Allah's hands. No, that, but see, that, the thing is, what's fascinating me as someone who didn't experience what you've experienced is, you know, you read about people like this, you know, you don't, you don't, you don't meet them, but you met them, right? I mean, the, this is like a maqam that you hear about, you know, pious people in our tradition yeah. who have that level of taqwa or iman or tawakkul. I mean, you, I mean, you met these people. I right. can tell you that is every single Palestinian on the ground. In the You're not country. exaggerating. You I'm know, not no, exaggerating right, one bit. Right. You have and no reason to. That was one of the hardest things for me to leave Gaza is because I knew I would lose that. You come to space, I mean, and unfortunately, like here in the US, for example, we're so worried about me, myself, and I, we think that we control everything. If I do this, then this is going to happen. And it's the inverse in Gaza. It, the generosity, for example. Uh, my first day as I as I was walking outside on the, on the street, uh, an older Amul comes up to me, torn up clothes, barely any shoes, just like torn up sandals, looked like he hadn't taken a shower in a couple of weeks. And he gives me two cookies. He said, I want you to have these. You could tell this, he didn't have much. He yeah. doesn't have much. Right. And big smile. And I was like, no, what? Like, you don't give this. To, I, it's okay. And he said, no, I want you to have this. And I want to thank you for being here with us. And you see people everywhere you go. If someone's eating, if there's, and usually it's not one person eating alone. Yeah. Like you would never see that. That's right. It's people coming together, eating out of the same dish. And they say, tfaddal. They always say, tfaddal. Come on, mm. come join us. Yeah. Um, and, and you were there during Ramadan. I, yeah. So I want to definitely hear about Ramadan. Yeah. Like what is Ramadan like there right now? Yeah. Let me, let me share yeah. a quick story though, to talk yeah. about that taqwa and yeah. that, that uh, steadfastness and not only that, just constant uh, belief that Allah is with me. Um, I there was a night where um, I um, I won't go into too much detail about the story of the patient, but the patient's a uh, uh, 15-year-old girl was, was pulled out of the rubble after spending three days under the rubble, seeing her entire family killed in front of her, and her cousin arrives uh, at her at her side. And here's that his uh, his cousin, her brother, Fuad, had been killed. And this kid just loses it. He's crying. He's bawling. He's saying, I, I love Fuad so much. He's my best friend. Why did they have to kill him? He didn't do anything. And for 20 minutes, I tried to hug him and and uh, kind of just try to give him perspective in the thought in the way I thought would give him perspective. And I said, Alhamdulillah, he didn't, he didn't experience any pain. He's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's in Jannah. And, you know, make dua for him. And I, I was, I thought I was doing what I could. And so I took him outside and we were walking outside as he was bawling. And uh, if you didn't know this, at the hospital that I was uh, working at, we actually housed a lot of uh, children who had lost all of their family members. Mm. And many of whom, all of whom uh, were either amputees because they lost a limb or they had half of a limb uh, fractured and broken and were awaiting evacuation for a higher level of care. And so as uh, Mahir and I are walking outside, a group of three of them, you know, come on their crutches and walkers over and they're telling me, Dr. Muhammad, what, who, who is he? Why is he crying? And this is nighttime. Uh, and they're, you know, huddling around, and I say, you know, uh, you know, he he just he just found out his cousin, his best friend, was killed, and they came around and they hugged him, and they said, "It's okay, Alhamdulillah." Say, Alhamdulillah, and uh, one of them says to him, "You know, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us in the Quran, the believers are those when they're tried with difficult times, say, Inna Lillahi wa Inna Ilaihi Rajiun." We all belong to Allah. We're all returning to Allah. And that was the thing that stopped Mahir's <laughs> crying and gave him relief. SubhanAllah. And these kids are how old? 8 to 11. The oldest was 11. <sighs> SubhanAllah. And uh, it See, gave me goosebumps. Right. And, you know, we all walked back to the tent. And uh, SubhanAllah, I just, um, 
you know, in those moments, I just like would just step away and just cry because yeah. we don't we don't get that here. Um, but those are those. Uh, that's the life that the people in Gaza are, are they're living. They're living day to day. They're living with perspective about the akhirah. Right. They're not living for this life. They enjoy life in whatever way means they can. Uh, flying kites, children flying kites before a sunset. Um, but they give you uh, an experience unmatched by any population in the world that you'll ever meet. Um, and it's because of that taqwa, that uh, in, intrinsic true belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah is going to protect me. And uh, Allah is all wise. And I'm, my wisdom is not above Allah's. And um, you see it every day in every action. Um, you know, it's the second time where I've asked a question and then hearing you answer, I've evaluated my own sort of, or, or I've had to check my own, you know, impetus or perspective in asking the question. And the reason I say that is because, for example, I asked about, you know, you know, things that defy explanation or a miracle, right? And for us, you know, you hear about miracles, you're like, oh, well, you know, their bodies and their piled up and they're, they're not rotting. You smell fragrance and musk. And I'm not saying that whether that happens or doesn't happen. But the point is, this is how we define miracles. But what you experience, just that story of those group of children who comforted, you know, someone at that tender age, um, that's a miracle. What you're describing in, in terms of who you came into contact with, that is a miracle. Like, we don't appreciate that because for us, the idea of a miracle is so grandiose. Mm -hmm. almost right we yeah. want to like were there angels who came and you saw them you know dr Sabe? Mm -hmm. like that's the stories that people want to hear it's just like this fascination yet the human spirit right the the that's the miracle yeah that you're experiencing every single day all the time and and it's uh it, it you feel like you have this withdrawal from it when you leave for um, sure i mean I, you know, I went to Umrah in December, right? And you you have withdrawal because you're like, oh, I was in the presence of this sanctified place and there was beauty and there was peace and there was, and then like someone else had a family member, they're, they're, they were in Medina and they were leaving yesterday. And I said, oh, well, now you've, now you've come to the, the, to the hardest part of the journey, which is leaving Medina. Yeah. So I can, you felt that way because of the sanctified space and the sanctified people you were with. Yeah. Yeah, and the and the and the the people make the space what it is, yeah. and and that's what it comes down to. Um, you know, physically, uh, you know, from physical injury, there are several instances where I had patients, by the way, where you'd think this person shouldn't be speaking or they should have been dead from the injury, and they're the people I was able to like discharge. Uh, wow. So, and it made me remember. When it's not your time, it's not your time. And uh, that was actually to go. just a side note. A lot of people ask me before I left, like, aren't you afraid of getting killed? Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, from my childhood, we we're always taught, like, you can't let that paralyze you. That fear of death, you, you're going to, when you're going to, everyone's going to die. You don't know when, how, where, but you're going to die. And a particular time is prescribed to you, you know, at that time. And so that cannot stop you from doing what you need to do from sharing the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you to better the world around you and so uh that was always kind of my my go-to at no point did I was I tr like afraid of dying it was more um worried that I wouldn't be able to contribute in the way that was most needed uh, but I, I had a lady come in shot in the neck uh most of these folks go to the operating room you know um, shot in the neck, subhanAllah, I didn't know how she was talking, in one side, out the other side, didn't touch a vessel, didn't go through her trachea, her windpipe, and we were bewildered. A gentleman shot in the neck in the back, in one side, out the other, didn't enter his spine. Um, these people would be parallel, I mean, if it yeah. just moved a few millimeters, caused paralysis. Um, Not to mention, mention death. Death, yes. For many people, it would, it would cause immediate death. Um, uh, you know, people shot shot in the back, right? Mm -hmm. And subhanAllah, it just goes through the muscle and just the bullet stuck in the back. And just I'd open it up there at the bedside, take it out, 
have him come back in a couple of days to see me. Like a quote unquote flesh wound. Yes. Yeah. I mean, but like it was ama- like those cases for me was, was yeah. kind of the reinforcing yeah. that when it's not your time, it is not your time. Right. And, um, uh, you know, nonetheless, I, I hated seeing the amount of pain inflicted on the population. Yeah. Uh, unnecessarily, like no one should uh, go through that cruel, uh, cruel punishment. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean the, the Palestinians just get right back up, smiling all the time. I was like, how are people smiling at me? Like I, you know, a lot of times I was like, how are you smiling? How are you like want to like tell me a joke or like yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, I, but. They're not going to let what's happening around them stop them from living the life that's been given to them by Allah, right? They're they're not sitting there crying about, you know, the circumstances that have been given to them by Allah. Right. They're there appreciating that the half uh, the, the, the cup is half full and uh, that's how they're operating. The cup is half full. It's not half empty. Just using whatever Allah has given them to kind of go through this next day. I, I want you to talk about like sort of life outside of what's happening, if that's even possible, because obviously you did experience Ramadan there. But before you do, you know, you mentioned your own sort of mindset, if you will, your, the the worldview, your faith, certainly that informed you putting the decision you were making in its context, in, in its right perspective. But I'm going to give a very profane analogy here and say, like, if I want to make a, if I want to take a boys trip and go with a bunch of guys, right, I have to get we I have to prepare weeks in advance, you know, smooth sh- schmooze the wife, make sure everything is fine at home. Your wife and kids, you have two boys, mm-hmm. young children, relatively, and of course your wife. Short of being angels, which I'm sure they are, like, can you just talk about what is that conversation like that you have with your with your family, saying I'm gonna I'm gonna do this? Yeah, it wasn't a unilateral decision. In fact, you know, since October, my wife was, you know, I remember my wife sending me a text message. I was at work, like the first, the second week of October, saying, hey, there are talks about potentially these hospital ships that may go to Gaza. You need to look into them to go. So that's the kind of wife I married. Alhamdulillah. Like, I mean, that's, no, that's my that's, wife. And that's, um, says volumes. So it, it wasn't that she, they were like, you know, yeah. uh, we were more worried about, you know, as, as kind of you mentioned, we, we run a coffee roastery and I roast the coffee. And so we were, I was more worried about tying up loose ends around, uh, you know, training my wife to roast. By the way, there'd be a, there's no. an alternative universe where we'd have you on the show just to talk about coffee roasting. <laughs> yeah. We've done an episode, for example, like with Mukhtar, you know, yeah. and he yeah. talked about his experiences. And so, you know, in, in an alternative universe, that's why you'd be on this podcast. Yeah. And inshallah, there'll be a time where you can come back and talk about that. Inshallah. Inshallah. I, I mentioned yeah. that because, anyway, you know, uh, there are other responsibilities here on the ground, right? right? And I wanted to make sure nothing, you know, we didn't drop the ball on anything. And so... Um, my wife had always been like, I will never roast, <laughs> you know, but, um, yeah, I mean, mashallah, she, she's like literally a superhuman, yeah. um, you know, uh, not only holding down the fort, uh, with respect to like, uh, you know, us parenting our children and, and doing everything we need to do for the home, but, uh, also, um, uh, you know, learning how to roast, which is not easy and fulfilling all the, 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 the orders that we get. And then, um, and then being my, you know, relaying what I was seeing on the ground there while I was in Gaza to people here. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that she, she was doing amazing things. Uh, my son, Ahmed, you know, we had just come back from El Salvador in January. How old are your boys, mission. if you don't mind me asking? Ahmed is 13 and Majid is 7. Okay. And Ahmed and I have been going since like 2020 to El Salvador on our medical mission. And he was like, I wish I could go with you. I want to go to Gaza with you. So it's like not running away or afraid. I mean, for them, it was obviously we missed each other so much. Uh, and you could tell like uh, it affected my boys, like being away and not knowing what would happen. Um, not to but, mention, yeah. talk about parenting by example, man. I mean, seriously, God bless you. I mean, like that, like th- th- those are life lessons. That you're, can you imagine? I mean, Omar, I mean just, you, you, I, I'm just, I, this last 90 minutes or whatever, yeah. I've been quieter than usual because I'm literally just, yeah. uh, you know, just digesting all, all this. So. Well, I know, I know what we say in our tradition about praising someone to their face. So please, uh, pardon me this indiscretion, but 
I, we have, I, I've sat, you know, we've been doing this show for 10 years and there are many, 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 many times where I've sat across this table or across from a guest who, you, you know, and you have a feeling of inadequacy because they're so much more knowledgeable than you or they've lived, uh, their, their life experiences are so much more enriching. I, it's, I don't think I have felt inadequate as much as I do, like Omar said, these 90 minutes sitting across from you, Dr. Sube, like you're truly ins inspirational. And uh, like I said, I mean, as a father, as a husband, as a, you know, as a professional, like on every facet of life. Mashallah, mashallah. Mashallah, mashallah. Like I have, no, no, but I'm saying, I'm just doing like this introspection yeah. of like. Yeah, just, I mean, the only thing to say is may Allah yeah. increase you, bless you. I mean, All of I mean, us Allah 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 honestly, like, uh, and like I said, that's why I asked your, you know, you, I, I asked you to pardon me before I even went into that because I, I just felt I had to convey that to you. You know, I, honestly, like I think, um, you know, one of the most uncomfortable things for me coming back was, uh, you know, focus on Muhammad Subah, and I never want that, nor do I think it's appropriate, right? Because it's not about me; yeah. it's about like. The people in Gaza, it's about what we do with the gifts that are given to us. And for me, always in the back of my mind is, what do I say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment when he asked me, you know, Hamad, I gave you this, you know, I gave you safety, took you out of a war zone, gave you an education, gave you all these privileges, the comforts, the luxuries of living in the valley. And what did you do with that? Right? Did, did, did I just use it to better myself and, you know? take care of my family. It's important to take care of our families, of course. But um, I think it would be inadequate to say, like, uh, to give that as a response. And so, mm. you know, I I think we just got to do things. That's one thing I learned also from, and you'll see that uh, embodied in the actions of people in Gaza is doing everything with ihsan, mm. right? Uh, doing things with excellence uh, manifested as I know I only have these limited resources available to me. How can I use them uh, in the best way to help this person who's dying, who's critically ill, right? Um, always, I mean, subhanAllah, like you think about Ihsan, right? And what does that look like in textbook? Like what is right, that, right. what do we read? And then you go to Gaza and you see people practicing Ihsan. And so for me, that's what I want. I want that to be in my day to day and not to uh, have other factors impeding my ability to to develop ihsan in my 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 actions so subhanallah i don't think i'm doing anything added you know above and beyond it's just what is given to us we've just got to use it to the max and and, Mash and that's uh that's how i function mm -hmm. you know subhanallah. absolutely um just i guess if you could as we wrap i know we've gone quite long and i thank you for the generosity of your time um, is uh, is Ramadan like? What's that look like even in Gaza right now? Um, it was a di you could you know from talking to people you could tell it was difficult because Ramadan is a very festive time yeah. in Gaza. They like I have a statistic here. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. mean like, but like when I was going through those statistics, 267 places of worship have been destroyed. So I mean, you know, the infrastructure like because again, when you think of Ramadan, you think of community, you think of Tarawi, you think of the masjid, you think of, you know, gathering spaces. Yeah. So, um, that's exactly how it's painted to me, you know, was painted to me in, in my mind when, when people would describe Ramadan prior in prior years in Gaza. Um, mm. you know, it drove around, uh, you know, uh, a day prior to the, the start of Ramadan in Rafah and you could see despite living in the dire circumstances that they're living under, people are decorating their tents. People are putting up little lanterns, um, little, you know, things they've made, mm. uh, trying to make it festive for the children, going around and passing around little trinkets to children. I witnessed this in, in front of my eyes. Um, uh, you know, you talk to people about, about tarawih, right? Most of the masajid, yeah, have been destroyed. And, uh, but people will tell you, well, yeah, it's painful to see that. It's painful, but... We can still have tarawih. So you have tarawih right outside the, the hospital tents. Uh, line up and have tarawih. People would pray tarawih together. Um, and um, it's it, we're not limited by structures, physical structures. Um, because Islam is beyond 
physical structures. Living our Dean is beyond physical structures. And so they didn't let that paralyze them. It it was difficult nonetheless. I mean, obviously people, uh, you know, reminisce about like how Ramadan was the prior year and how we could, you know, everybody would apologize to me actually. They say, Wallahi, uh, Abu Ahmed, if if it wasn't for these circumstances, we'd be having you over for iftar at our home. Hmm. Wallahi, if we had our home, but we're in the tent. It's like, subhanAllah, <laughs> right. why are you telling me about having me over for iftar? It's like, Wallahi, we are so like embarrassed to to not ha- be able to invite you over. I mean, this is what they're telling me. It's like, subhanAllah. So um, that's Ramadan right now. It's, uh, you know, I remember the first suhoor, I woke up for suhoor and, um, you know, you have a piece of bread and, you know, maybe a date. We were, I had the luxury of having some dates. Um, and uh, I remember that first night, you hear, you know, they make an adhan before the, yeah, the Fajr adhan, like right? 10 minutes or whatever. Yeah. And you hear, you hear the adhan and then you just hear missile strike after missile strike in between the Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and a missile strike. And all I could think about was Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than all of this. And this is what's going to get them through through this uh, uh, catastrophe. Right. Um, that's Ramadan in Gaza right now. It's very difficult. It's very difficult because there's no food and um, there's very, very uh, scarce amount of food. And, and let, let's not forget northern Gaza is magnitudes worse than the South, uh, subhanAllah. I mean, people are dying as we speak right now because of lack of access to water, to basic food, you know, their basic food needs that could easily be prevented by opening the border, like right now. Um, going 25 miles or 20 miles is not that, doesn't take long, uh, but it's deliberately being withheld um, and may Allah give them sabr and I mean, patience and uh, wherewithal to uh, get through this. Yeah, I, but, mean, um, I mean, yeah, that, that was Ramadan, that Ramadan experience for me in Gaza. Mm. And there's so many thoughts yeah, I have just we, reflecting we, on Ramadan, but I want to, I want to wrap up. Uh, yeah, and, 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 and I was just going to ask as we wrap, you had mentioned, uh, I can't remember if it was at the beginning of the show or, or before we started recording about potentially returning. Right. Yeah, inshallah. I'm trying. So my my main objective right now, or my main focus, has been naturally as I have returned, is to share people's stories because it's so important. Like when we hear these statistics, it kind of uh, it, it devalues the those human lives that have been mm-hmm. taken away unjustly from the world. And uh, so my focus has been to to meet with elected officials, decision makers that are Good. directly. Uh, contributing to what we're seeing on the ground yeah, and try to educate folks and try to bring, bring light to what's happening there on the ground from my perspective and uh, hopefully carve out time uh, if I'm given the opportunity to go back to return to Gaza. Has the perspective of the folks you're talking to, like yeah. the politicians, has that, have you seen a shift at all? Have you been able to, um, or shift or like, I guess, just, what are you seeing? Like, are you seeing, you know, people are at least open to the idea of listening to your experiences with an open mind. People are definitely willing to listen. Okay. Uh, it varies on the people you're talking to. Some people come in with already kind of in the mind, in their mind, that's, it doesn't matter what the cost is, wow. which is unfortunate. I mean, I had uh, a meeting with an elected official who gave me an analogy of, you know, if, if folks from Baja, California came up <sighs> to the U.S. and took hostages, I'm sure the majority of Americans would be okay with us going down and doing the same to Baja, California. And I was appalled. Uh, and luckily, my wife was with me, who was very vocal and said, you know, really? <laughs> like, you rethink what you just said. Like, yeah. how could that be okay? And e- even if the majority of Americans thought it was okay, how how is that okay as a human being? Right. right? Or as a leader to say that. Right? Yeah. And and. and you, people, they don't see that that's wrong. So right. That's, a that's sad what I'm thing. saying. There's like this disconnect. Yeah. And it's I mean, dehumanization. It's, it's, all about it's, dehumanization. It's, it's, it's rooted in uh, one value, one life being more valuable than another. 100%. Which is, oh, 100%. Which is like, goes back to the original story of Adam and Shaitan, 100%. right? 100%. Yes. Yeah. You're constantly reminded of that. Um, but, the, you know, at the same time, there are people who, uh, you know, uh, from, you know, I, I bring photos and show them yeah. the, the pictures that I've taken. 
I, you know, I brought back shrapnel, a bullet and a bullet I pulled out of a child. It, it, it's different when you see it, when you touch it, when you realize right. this is our tax money. Th- these are sent from here. Mm. Um, and what, what do you want to do as a human being who's given the responsibility of making policy decisions right. that uh, directly, uh, you know, d- decide on the fate <coughs> of the people there on the ground? And I leave it up to them. I, I, my belief is like, look, at the end of the day, uh, when you're, we're all messengers, right? And we can, I can show you everything I saw. I can share with you my experiences. It's up to you at the end of the day. Are you going to make the right decision or not? Nothing I say more than that is, is going to necessarily change your mind. But it's imperative that people tap into their humanity and realize our collective humanity and yeah. how we share the same life experiences. And also, we're all going to be held to account at the end of the day. And so, yeah, I, th- I think it varies in terms of the responses, but I'm hopeful that people will wake up and realize that this is not only inhumane, it's it's against our American core values of uh, freedom, justice, humanity for everyone. And um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So like you spoke about the reaction you're, you're finding from elect uh, or people, you know, power brokers. What about just sort of people who want to contribute? Are you talking to other physicians who perhaps may be interested in going? Um, even if you aren't, I mean, you, I would imagine there are listeners right now who are physicians, may be interested in pursuing, you know, um, a trip out there. Uh, how can they do that? And then speak also to the non-physicians, the, the non-medical people. How yeah. can we help? What can we do? Yeah. Ever since I got back, it's been a couple of weeks now, yeah. um, I've, I've held several kind of... Uh, Zoom calls with physicians who are going or planning to go or want to go. Uh, one, uh, you know, for physicians going or nursing staff or whatnot, right. uh, knowing what the process is to even get in because it can throw you off if you don't know just the logistics, answering questions about my experience, and then figuring out how they can best contribute. Uh, because like I said, you don't want to be a burden on the system when you go there. And my experience was unique in that we set up a field hospital as opposed to a lot of the other NGOs work in in hospitals that are still functioning. Oh, I was going to say, and, and, and I would imagine like any physician, you don't have to necessarily be an ER physician to be able to probably help on the ground. It uh, and I say that because like I have a friend of mine who is a interven- an interventional radiologist mm-hmm. and he says, you know, okay, I don't know if my skill set may be applicable to what's on the ground, but I, I have enough medical training to know I could do something. Yes. So, yeah. so is that true? Yeah, the, yeah. I, I would I would say there's a wide range of specialties that are needed okay. there on the ground. <laughs> um, it just depends on the group you go with and where they're, uh, you know, where they're deployed in Gaza, and what the needs are there at that facility. Um, in terms of non medical folks, I think first and foremost, medical or non medical, is realize your power. Uh, the power of your voice, mm. power of bringing awareness about the situation to those closest to you. Don't be afraid of retaliation. As long as we're speaking the truth and doing it in a respectful manner, which we can all do, we can all be respectful. Our goal, our role is to sp- you know, share the truth with people, bring light to the situation, um, and to also prevent it from ever happening again. So that's our number one power. And we're very lucky and privileged in the United States to have the freedom of speech And we should really exercise that to the max. Uh, Secondly, doing whatever you can within your own kind of industry to uh, see how you can contribute, whether it be, you know, try to see how we can send supplies or if you're working within the government agencies, seeing how you can move the needle there. Um, uh, You know, if you're working in education, how do you bring... How do you bring awareness around what's happening in Palestine and uh, education? Um, and, and, And... be unafraid, mm-hmm. be unafraid, because that's the biggest thing that we get shackled with is the fear. And I, I want to end with a, just this example. My seven-year-old wore his watermelon sweatshirt oh, to yeah. school. Right. And we got a call from the principal the other day saying, parents are really afraid of what that means. Wow. And I uh, said, what, what, what are they afraid of? It's a watermelon. What does it represent? So the principal really wanted to know what it represents, which was a great time for us to educate the principal about what watermelon represents, mm-hmm. right? About freedom, uh, freedom from occupation, freedom from oppression for Palestinians. Yeah. 
and uh, not only Palestinians, but everyone. It really trickles into every. This this is representative of freedom for humanity, and so um, don't be afraid. Don't don't tell your kids to stop wearing their watermelon sweatshirts. No, wear wear them and wear and and hand them out to people. Um, or and kafiyas so, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Just be unapologetically yeah. 100%, 100%. human. Hundred percent. That's what we're all about. And so um, I think it's hard. It's harder said than done, but. We, that's what we have to do and that's what people in Gaza expect us to do because mm. we've been given that privilege what informs the next steps then like would like what would be the only like what would prevent you from going back versus what would help facilitate you going back so definitely there's always a big question mark on clearances uh-huh. right and i've been alhamdulillah very vocal and have uh, been provided with a platform to share several platforms to share my you know the stories of of the people i cared for um, and then uh, a lot of it is me being able to move around shifts and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I have my responsibilities here with my group who, uh, my groups and, and both hospitals I work at here have been very gracious and supportive and, uh, and alhamdulillah, super lucky. Yeah. Um, and they've covered my shifts and you know, checked in on Naima and the boys. And so it's just a matter of me being able to, to do that and seeing, you know, where we go from there uh, and and what's happening now is 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 uh, there's a potential you know for movement into Rafah and what uh, what does that look like in terms of our ability to do mm. our work yeah. on the ground um i guess finally um you know I, we always ask people where can you know people engage them online or whatever i, I think I, my understanding is you've been documenting some of what you experienced in um on on your instagram account yeah instagram <laughs> handle is at doc Sobeh. D O C S U B is in boy E H. And uh, yeah, my actually, my wife and younger sister, uh, while I was away, were uploading my daily uh, video video logs uh, that I was making about, uh, you know, one, that I was alive, and uh, two, my experiences. And, and, you know, by chance, actually, ended up being that I, the thing that kept me going every day was I had to find a silver lining for the day. Mm. And I would share my silver lining for the day. And so, alhamdulillah, um, that kept me going, just putting things into perspective, because uh, otherwise it would be very debilitating. So, yeah. But all of those should be on on the Instagram, uh, and, you know, folks can feel free to message us, inshallah. Okay. You just inspired me to spend more time on Instagram, which I don't, har- I, I, I hardly do. So, uh, but now I know wh- where to go and find you and, and check out those, the content that you did provide. And, I, yeah, I, know, and, I know you've been doing a lot of media, even while you were there, but even when you've come back, you're meeting with elected officials out of all that busy schedule in this month of Ramadan, you took the time out to sit with us for like two hours. So thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate everything you're doing. May Allah give you success I and, mean, and, and amplify your voices. Thank you so much. I cannot thank you enough. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that, yeah. like I said, like we, you've already talked about this. Like this is this. I think this episode is so important. Mm-hmm. On on one hand, on a global like what's happening in the big picture, but I think we just got so much out of it on an individual level, That's like true. personal takeaways about like your relationship with Allah, how we can look at um, things from a you called it like cup half full, glass half full, but it, that that lens of gratitude of the Palestinian people that and if we can even get a, an ounce of that, right. I think they'll be beneficial for our listeners and for us. <laughs> exactly. Because, you know, you mentioned about people who are played with difficulty, you know, they say, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi rajiun, but the verse begins by saying, We'll surely test you with a modicum of fear, famine, loss of life, property, and you know, and so that that's what what, what you experienced. Though again, I go back to this: you saw that firsthand, and you see it in real life. So, uh, no, thank you for that, Omar. Absolutely, I'm echoing what Omar just said because I think that that's a takeaway uh, that everyone who's listening can you know, take from this conversation. So, Dr. Sube, thank you so much, and uh, may Allah uh, help facilitate. The work that you're doing, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep you safe as you do continue the work you're doing. Thank you so much. And to your wife and to your kids, your family, uh, may Allah protect them and bless them all. Thank you so Amen. much. Thank you. And as always, listeners, please continue to listen. Uh, these are the last final days of Ramadan. These are the last final 10 days of Ramadan. Um, well, I think the very least that we can do is make dua for those who are suffering in Palestine, in Gaza, 
especially these last few days, let's all of us collectively do the very least that we can, which is to make du'a. May Allah, may Allah elevate them. May Allah ease their suffering. May Allah provide them succor and comfort and tranquility. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless those who have already fallen. May Allah heal those who are suffering. May Allah heal those who are struggling. May Allah help facilitate the liberation of Palestine. May Allah help facilitate the liberation of Palestine from the yoke of oppression. We pray fast last few days. Um, I think that's the very least that we can do in this blessed month of Ramadan. Have a wonderful rest of your Ramadan. Please remember this very small show in your dua, in your supplications. And we probably won't see you until then. So an early Eid Mubarak. And as always, we'll catch you on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence.